Hello and welcome. My name is Eddie Button and I am the second countertenor in the King Singers. Today I have the delightful job of introducing the first in a series of workshops for the King Singers New Music Prize. Throughout history, music has provided hope and healing at some of society's most challenging times. And we've launched the King Singers New Music Prize to recognize and encourage a spirit of musical creativity in today's world. There's free entry, four categories, a panel of wonderful world-renowned judges, and the choice of five beautiful texts to set. We've partnered with publisher Walton Music so that the winning works can be made available for performance. And there's a $1,500 prize as well. We really hope to be able to premiere the winning works in Washington National Cathedral on Sunday, February 28th, 2021. We also wanted to help composers develop their craft by offering a series of free digital masterclasses with leading figures from the world of composition. And there's no better place to start than with today's speaker, Charles Anthony Silvestri. I'll soon hand you over to Johnny, our bass, to introduce him. The New Music Prize is generously supported by our dear friend, Ron Gunnell, and our charity, the King Singers Global Foundation, which is a 501c3 in the US. The competition forms part of the foundation's vision for finding harmony in our divided world. We'd be really grateful if you'll submit any question you have in the live chat, and Johnny will make sure as many of them as possible get asked. Johnny, over to you. Hi there, everyone. Yes, my name's Johnny, and in case you don't know me, I'm the bass in the King Singers and have been for just under 10 years. And it is my great privilege today to introduce the extraordinary poet, author, lyricist, uh, academic and perfect guy, generally, Charles Anthony Silvestri. He's the man who's written texts for many of Eric Whitaker's most famous pieces of music, like Sleep and Looks Are Room. Um, but he has written for so many other um, composers and artists. I remember the King Singers had the great privilege of having a text written by him for a piece called River's Lament that was composed by the Australian uh, composer Elena Katz Chernin in 2011. And we gave the premiere of that back in 2011 in my first season. He has done so much and there are some wonderful things that you can explore after the session if you want to. Um, the first are two amazing illustrated books um, illustrated kind of picture books of the texts for Sleep and also Leonardo Dreams of His Flying Machine, both of which are pieces composed by Eric Whitaker. And then there's a wonderful um, collection that's recently been released of all the poetry that he's composed for or he's written for composers over the last 20 years called A Silver Thread. And I hope that Tony has a copy that he can maybe show us later. On August the 28th, um, his piece, um, his, co his collaboration with Eric Whitaker, um, The Sacred Veil, um, will also be available for you to download or to order from Signum Records online. It is an extraordinary exploration of his uh, wife's battle with ovarian cancer, his late wife's battle with ovarian cancer that's incredibly profound and moving. And I urge you all to read the text, which is available on his website, and also to listen to the piece when you can. Over the course of this session, we're going to be exploring the relationship between text and music. And what we can do is composers to get the most out of the text that we're setting. What's really interesting is that though Tony has been predominantly, I think, in his professional life, a writer, he has also composed and has done precisely the task that you are faced with because he swapped roles with Eric Whitaker about three years ago to write the piece Each Morning She Walks, where Eric wrote the text and he wrote the music. And I think that was also a very symbiotic process. We are so grateful that he has written a piece for us, for this composition, a piece, a poem, called When All Falls Silent, which is one of the five poems that you can choose to set as part of the new music prize. And I'm sure he'll talk to us a bit about that too, and why he chose to write it and what it means to him. Without further ado, well, I should have said finally that yes, he is Charles and Anthony Silvestri, but to all of us, he's Tony. And he is going to be here right now. I can't wait. Hello. Hey, gentlemen. Hey, Tony. Hey. It's wonderful to thank be here. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Really, thank you so much. Well, did we do okay? Did we? Uh, we didn't say anything outrageous about you, did we? <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm blushing here. <laughs> oh, please! <laughs> you never blush. <laughs> yeah, you can't thank see you it with my, my beard's too white. 
<laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for um, spending some time with all of us today. I, I think it's it's this it is this afternoon, or maybe just this afternoon where you are. It's definitely six p.m. here in London. Just, just. Um, but we can't wait to hear what you have to say. Wow. Uh, and I do have a lot to say, and and I want to thank uh, the King Singers for inviting me to not only be a part of this uh, New Music Prize uh, project, and it was such a great uh, honor to be able to write for you again, um, but also to speak uh, on, in this forum to uh, composers or anyone interested in sort of peeking uh, behind the poet's pen uh, to talk a little bit, to give me the opportunity to talk a little bit about what I do, how I craft a text to be sung, uh, and then and maybe uh, um, a little bit about how a composer can look at a text, uh, either one that's been created as a lyric poem or one that uh, wasn't explicitly created for that purpose, how to find the, the music in it, uh, maybe to aid in the, the, uh, in the composition process. So that's sort of what my goal is. Um, for this presentation. And uh, if if either of you have any questions for me that occur to you that you want, just go ahead and interrupt me. And uh, if I'll be looking at the chat, uh, if questions come up too, um, maybe you could uh, alert me to those or, or if, I, if I catch them as they scroll by, then maybe I'll interrupt myself. But uh, there will be time for questions uh, for sure at the end. And I'm happy to, uh, to talk about your, your specific questions, not only about the process, about me, or about the texts that uh, the King Singers have chosen for this competition. And yes, we should say, please do ask as many questions as you like in the chat. Um, it is there for that reason, and we try to answer as many as possible over the course of this presentation. Oh, I already, I already see Thank questions you. coming in. Um, so Good, no? basically what I wanted to talk about was um, what are the essential elements for, for writing a poem that's going to be sung? Um, poetry is basically the, the expression of, of a human truth, whether it's an observation about the world or um, a deep emotion, um, anything like that. And it's done so in a very intentional sort of a way. Uh, and there are all different kinds of poems. There are different genres, different forms and structures. Lyric poetry is simply one of many ways of expressing yourself through poetry. Now, there are some poems where the poet has gone through elaborate lengths to craft the way that the poem looks on the page. Uh, I saw a poem once, I don't remember the poet, but it's called Forsythia, and it's the, the words of the poem uh, go out in, in sort of vines and, and stems and flowers. That, that poem, these poems are beautiful, but they'd be very hard for a composer to set. What would a composer do? with the structure of a poem on a page. E.E. E. Cummings was famous for, for uh, shaping his poems in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So there are some poems that just don't lend themselves uh, easily to being set by composers. Likewise, there are a whole bunch of poems that just sound beautiful, but there are portions of them that are, the word I like to use is crunchy. Uh, it would make it very difficult to create a choral sound with a poem that has a lot of um, hard consonants or difficult vowel sounds in difficult places. We'll talk about all of this. Um, and likewise, there are lyrics to songs that wouldn't stand on a page as a poem. Uh, they might make a great, you know, uh, singable bop, but when you extract the lyrics from the melody or from the production, and then you look at it on the page, a Justin Bieber song or something like that, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's not going to be included in the Norton anthology um, of poetry. And so the crafting of a lyric poem sort of bridges the gap between those two worlds where, where the lyric poet has to write a poem that is going to present on a page as a poem that does all the things that a poem is supposed to do, but it also has to be singable. Uh, the lyric poet has to be mindful of structural and, and musical elements uh, in writing um, in order to do some of the heavy lifting uh, for the composer. So when the composer gets a lyric poem, um, and that's basically what I do, I, I, I write for composers uh, to their specifications. Um, the poetry that that naturally comes uh, to me just based on my experience is also um, lyrical in its nature. Uh, just as a chorister, I 
I just think musically through uh, my poetry as I write. So um, there's a handout that uh, sort of a takeaway PDF that's included in um, the materials uh, here for this uh, live broadcast that kind of breaks down some of the things that I'll be talking about in this presentation. So you can take notes and I, I would encourage you to, uh, as a professor, I have to ask you to take notes. Um, but there's also this uh, this PDF handout and I've got a slide of it too that I can show you. So uh, yeah, Eddie, if you could put up that slide um, of the handout. Uh, I don't know if people can see it already or. Um, I think that's the one that's already up, isn't it? It's already up there, okay, great. So basically I, I've, I've broken it down to a list of structural elements and uh, singability elements that I'm always conscious of and intentional about when I'm crafting a poem. Uh, that's going to be set for chorus. Uh, and I do want to say, setting, s writing a poem for a solo performer, for an art song, for example, uh, some of the pressure is taken off because a soloist can pretty much handle any text that you give him or her. Um, they, uh, they can do crunchy stuff. They can, um, they can sing almost anything uh, as a solo. But when you're setting, when you're writing for chorus, you have to be really mindful of the choral tone, unified vowel sounds. Um, the poet has to be mindful of when the composer is going to have an ascending line or a descending line and what vowels is the composer going to be giving the tenors or sopranos, treble voices or basses in an ascending or a descending line to make sure that vowel is singable. Um, you don't want to have a line that has a bright E vowel at the end of it where the, the paintable text is obviously going to be an ascending line up into the higher register of the voice. And so I try to be mindful of all those things. So first I want to talk about the structural elements um, that I try to think about and be intentional about when I'm writing for chorus, um, writing a poem for a composer uh, for chorus. And then we'll talk about elements of singability. And again, if you have questions, I see them coming in in the chat and I think it's it's great and I'd love to get to all of them. So there are, there are classic song structures. Uh, think about Tin Pan Alley songs or old Broadway songs. You know, you have verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and then a bridge, and then the chorus again. And the chorus can be some repeated line taken from the verse, or it can be a fully crafted, um, uh, a, a fully crafted chorus of multiple lines. That's sort of the most standard song structure. And you see it in rock and roll songs, in pop songs, in Broadway. Um, in folk songs very often. Um, folk songs and hymns can be somewhat different in that it's just sort of stanza based and each stanza is almost exactly the same. Um, church hymns don't have a bridge usually. Sometimes the organist might improvise one between the third and fourth verses uh, with a modulation or something exciting to break up the structure. So I always try to think about the, the journey that the audience is going to take when they hear the choral work that's going to be created based on the poem that I wrote. Um, a poem, a choral work needs to have a beginning and a middle and an end. And the audience needs to know what the rules are of the world in which the choral piece exists. Uh, when is the beginning? When is the middle? When is the end? What are those transitional moments? And so I try to bake those in to the poem that I write uh, so that, again, as I said, the, the heavy lifting is kind of done by me. Uh, and so the poem basically just sort of sets itself. Um, you also have to think about the programmatic needs of the, of the, the choir that is performing the work as well. The director is going to choose this work uh, is it a concert opener? Is it a concert closer? Is this a work to present just before the interval um, between two halves of a concert? Uh, is this work supposed to be the smiler of the concert, right, to get the audience chuckling? Or is it going to be a darker part of the, um, of, of the, of the program? So you have to think about that and, and, and make a poem that kind of lives in one of those worlds uh, rather than goes back and forth between two wildly divergent um, moods or, or themes, as it were. Um, 
think about the programmatic needs of the audience too. Again, that's the, the beginning, middle and end, uh, the, the, the story that it tells. Um, I try to be mindful of creating that. I can write a haiku and a, a composer can set a haiku. It would be a rather short piece of music unless it has lots of repeats. But even then, there's not much that a haiku can accomplish in its, in its small form. I mean, what it can do is it can open for just a moment the curtain and show an exquisite little perfect snow globe moment of, of life and time and nature and whatever. Um, and then the curtain closes. And so there's not a lot of storytelling that's possible in, in that kind of uh, uh, form. So that's why composers don't often set uh, haikus or they'll set series of haikus as, as a single piece. Uh, so I try to think about those programmatic needs of the composer, of the audience, of the, of the director. A um, couple of different things. So when I'm crafting a poem, I try to stay close to what I call the rule of three. Uh, you never want to do the same thing three times. You can repeat yourself once but you can't repeat yourself twice. So if you're going to have a repeating motive, you only get two shots at it. If you're going to do the, if you're going to do it the third time, it has to be different. It has to be tweaked, right? So if the poem is statement, statement, then there has to be a question and then there can be another statement at the end. So so doing the same thing three times in a row, then it becomes a hymn-like structure and that may or may not be what the composer wants and it kind of binds the composer in a way that that I don't like to do when I when I'm writing for uh, for choral composers, so that's the rule of three: never never um, never repeat yourself three times. I think it was Johnny Carson's comedy rule. You know, you can get away with the same joke twice, but you can't get away with it three times in a row. Uh, and then the rule of four is another another version of that, where if your poem has four has a four part structure, the third part of the poem has to be different. It has to be different in structure. It has to be different in tone. It has to be different in theme. Um, because right about that point of the octavo, the, the audience needs, they're getting fidgety, right? And they need something different. They need a modulation. They need a shift to minor mode. They need, um, they need the climax of the work or the nadir of the work has to occur right at that third of four parts. Um, the, all these these things that I'm talking about, the, the, the third being a little different, um, the uh, not violating the rule of four, these, these elements of a poem are called the volta, the turn. So you're going along and you're following a path and then all of a sudden there's a turn in the path and that makes the poem more exciting it gives the composer something to do that's different than what they've done before. Uh, it allows them to build up to the climax. It allows them to go back and repeat what they've done before to build up tension for the thing that's different. Mm -hmm. um, the volta or the turning is probably the most exciting part of the poem of the piece. It may or may not be the climax of the choral work that gets created. That's up to the composer. But the trick then is, where do you put the volta of a poem if you are also thinking structurally giving the composer and the director and the audience what they need to create a, an effective choral octavo or and then ultimately an effective program um of course the the best place for the volta of a poem is right at the golden mean of the poem um maybe you could go eddie to uh the first yeah. golden mean slide uh, from philosophers and architects and painters and poets and sculptors and all manner of, of artistic um, endeavors throughout many, many centuries. Uh, the, the, the slide that has the, the spiral, the Fibonacci yes. spiral on it. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, it's built into nature. It's built into uh, great art. It's sometimes unconscious but sometimes it's very intentional. And I try to put the volta of my poetry right intentionally at, at or around where the golden mean 
uh, would go uh, in the poem. So if it's a if it's a mm -hmm. four stanza poem, then the golden mean is going to be somewhere in the third stanza, sort of midway through the third stanza, or it'll be the whole third stanza is the golden mean moment, the, the chapter of the golden mean, uh, where things change. Mm -hmm. That's where the volta is going to be. And then the composer can either build to a big finish or can collapse back into the beginning idea that's altered by the journey. You know, it's like a, it's like a classic hero's journey. Uh, the first measures, the first 16 bars of the piece are the hero introducing the hero in the ordinary world. And then the choral octavo goes through an adventure. And then the volta is that moment when the hero faces the dragon and there's the cataclysmic showdown. And then at the end, the hero returns home but does so transformed, transfigured, altered by the adventure. Um, it's, you could call it sonata form, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's just the old hero's journey. And I try to build that into my poetry as well, uh, intentionally. If you look at the next slide, it's kind of a breakdown um, of the golden mean, a little bit, a, a little bit different view of the golden mean and, and where, the, uh, where the volta then would occur uh, in a poem. So you have the longest bit of the poem, which would be part A, and that can be two stanzas long or three or 25 minutes or whatever, depending on the, the, the needs of that particular composer or that particular mm -hmm. poem. And then the volta is going uh, is gonna to turn the tide of the poem, either thematically, in terms of color, in terms of um, mood, form difference, you're breaking the rhyme scheme or something that's different about the volta and then the B section the, fin the, the final act, as it were, act three, is going to be, uh, is going to be a little bit different. Um, there's a slide there that uh, it might be difficult to see, but it's a poem that I wrote for uh, the composer Kim Arneson in Norway, and it's called Grunland. And uh, I, just, I put it here just sort of as an example of the way that I might incorporate a, a, go a golden mean volta um, into... Uh, um, in, into this poetry. Uh, he asked me to write about this neighborhood of Oslo called Grunland, which is where a lot of Syrian uh, refugees have come to live. And uh, he wanted me to write too about the, the sort of difficulties of the Norwegian people to accept uh, these, these newcomers and, and the kind of struggles of immigrants anywhere in any culture to, to adapt and, and uh, live into their new community. And so if you see, it's a four stanza poem and the first stanza and the second stanza are identical in structure and in tone. They both begin with a list of spices that you might find at a market, a Syrian market in Grunland, uh, cumin and coriander, uh, peppercorns, cassia. And then the next one begins with sumac and rose petal, saffron, harissa, right? So I can't break the rule of three I need to do something different for the third stanza. Even though the third stanza is structured the same way, now instead of spices, I've turned to what their experience was in their home country. Um, uh, violence and hunger and poverty and so on. Not spices, but negative experiences that they're here to, to escape. And then in the fourth stanza, I can go back again to the list of spices. That, that's just a quick example of, um, of the way that the Volta and the Golden Mean might coincide with one another uh, when you're thinking structurally. Um, Tony, maybe if we, if we could go, yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to think, um, I, I used to study geography and um, one of the things we, we talked about in one of our lectures was this thing about nature being Having having some, I think it was some. I can't remember much of my degree, sadly, but but it was something about some golden ratio in nature. And it, are you kind of saying is this kind of slightly along the same lines, but that you can sometimes break that to have extra impact as well? Yes, uh, there's a there's a there's this sort of theory of aesthetics that what makes something beautiful. Uh, follows the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio and all of that. And, and you're right, we see it in nature all the time, in leaf patterns, in growth structures, in um, shells and floral motifs, the seeds of a sunflower, the center of a sunflower, all, it, it, all manner of things, honeycombs. 
uh, they're all based on the golden mean. And so when you're figuring out how to hang a picture, there's a you hang it in just the right way and you say, oh yeah, that, that looks good. And you might not be aware that what you're doing is you're dividing your wall exactly in the golden mean and that's where you've put your picture and it looks good to you there. Um, where do you sign your name on the line of the signature line? You know, you might, you might break the golden mean and move it. So it's not right at the beginning of the line, but it's slightly ahead of the beginning of the line so that when you divide the whole line into two segments, your signature is going to be right there, right? Right, right. right at the golden mean. It's going to be centered there. And you do this without even thinking about it. Um, or you can be very intentional about it. If you look at the Parthenon or, or you know, uh, Renaissance buildings or the structure of Botticelli paintings or the Apple logo, uh, any number of things, they're all very consciously designed around the golden mean. But I love what you said, Eddie, about breaking that pattern in order to create a kind of shocking mm. moment, right? It's like, you know, Bach using a tritone or something like that. Yeah. Like what? Why do you do that? You do it so that people st sit back and say, oh, whoa, I got to attend to this, right? Uh, cubism is an example of that. Although there's, there's intricate geometry in, in cubism as well, but, but to consciously alter what we see as beautiful and, and proper um, is itself an, an, a, a form of intentional, um, uh, intentional uh, uh, creation. Did you, did you have something to say too, uh, Johnny? I don't, you had your hand oh, up. Well, no, well, I was, well, I, I was just going to say, I think, you know, the Mona Lisa is, I think, famously kind of like a perfect instance of the golden ratio, isn't yeah. it? If you think it's the distance between her eyes and between her mouth, much like your face, Tony, actually, it's the perfect distance between <laughs> all of these different elements that make it so, that make it so special. And I, yeah, I, in, in art, it's just seen over and over again when you mentioned yeah. Botticelli, it made me think of it. And you know, and I think I think there's there's a reason why we gravitate to certain works of art, or as tourists, we go back to see certain buildings again and again and again. And it's there's something perfect about that proportion that appeals to our senses, and it's probably because it's written into our DNA, um, because we see it all over in nature, in the structure of trees, in the shape of a wine bottle, uh, in in you know in any number of things um fish scales uh, it, we just we come in contact with it consciously or unconsciously time and time again all day long every day mm. and so it, it sort of appeals to us um if you could go back to the handout uh, uh slide then we'll start i want to start talking about the singability aspects um of of writing for a chorus uh, so structural aspects are important and that kind of gives the foundation but then I want to create an edifice that has music built into it. And there are, there are, there are lots of different ways that I uh, try to embed music, bake in the music into the poetry. Um, one of the most important things that I, I do is as a chorister, as a singer, I simply sing my poetry. Um, I'm always chanting what I'm writing to make sure that it it feels good in the mouth, that it has a delicious kind of flow to it. Or if it's hard for me to sing, it's not right. The poetry's not right. I've got to go back to the drawing board and fix it. And I would encourage all composers who are trying to write for, for voice to actually sing. If you can't sing it, then the singers can't sing it. Um, and so if, it, if, it, if, it, if you want to set this particular poem, then begin to create those melodies, even just by chanting it on a, on a drone note. Um, at least you'll, you'll then be able to identify the rhythms in the poem. Um, that's another cool thing that composers can do is, is as you read a text, um, find out what the rhythm is of that text. Uh, I'll just use as an example the, the first couple of lines of the Dunbar poem for this competition. Um, mm -hmm. Come when the nights are bright with stars, or come when the moon is mellow. So, come when the nights are bright with stars, or come when the moon is mellow, right? It's a very simple exercise, but if you notated that in, in rhythmic notation, you, there's your melody, there's at least the rhythm part of your melody right there. And if you chant through that, 
then you'll kind of know where the rubato moments are and you'll know what your own instinct is as a singer uh, to, to, to capture the music that Dunbar embedded in this particular text. Um, before a disaster happens, I, I would like to apologize for my cat who <laughs> never pays any attention to me unless I am recording something, so. I say he she is is a, is a lion behind you, <laughs> right. a, a, a beast. She, um, she demands I had a quick question. Here. So anyway, uh, I love that. Just I, little, just, I wanted little... to say, I wanted to say just to to follow up on what you were saying there. I think as as a singer and as someone who's had a lot of work written for the group while while I've been in it, the best um, compositions are the ones where they have really <laughs> thought about like how do we breathe this not only not only as the, like, compositionally but also in terms of the the text like if yeah. there's if, if you've if you've sent in something where there is no way for for me to breathe without ruining the kind of the intention the meter the flow then right. then it's not it's not either it's not the best poem to set or it's not been set particularly well like that is that is like the, the rule number one for me wow <laughs> yeah yeah no Maybe. But breathing too you have to be mindful not only of the words the vowels and consonants but also the silences that are that are built into the poem mm -hmm. um the poet has to be very mindful of the punctuation um d does do i do i really want a comma here uh do i want just a, do i want the singers to stop and start again or do i want just a little luftpause um and so what punctuation I choose might make a difference in how the singers are going to, to interact with that or how the composer might interact with that. Um, so I chant through what I write. Um, sometimes I'll choose, if I'm stuck and I really don't know how to begin a poem, uh, I never tell composers this, but I will just choose a melody, uh, an already existing melody, a hymn tune or a folk song or something like that. And, and I'll just re redo the lyrics to that melody. It, it, just, it just gives me a place to start. It gives me a structural starting place. And then I'm off and running. But sometimes when I'm just sort of stuck, um, I, I give myself that creative constraint. And so either chanting or, or using a melody, um, or sometimes I'll just compose a melody for it. There's always music going on in my head and in my mouth as I'm writing the text. And so I'm, I really am writing lyrics. I'm not, I'm not writing a poem per se from the very beginning of the process. It's always lyrical. Um, I also have to think as the composer might think. Uh, I have to be predictive about rising lines, descending lines. I have to be, um, if for example, I'm, I'm talking about uh, a, a phoenix rising into the sky, um, in order to burst into flames or whatever. Uh, I wanna make sure that I, I know what the composer is gonna do. They're gonna build this moment and the voices are gonna rise to the higher parts of their register as we talked before. Um, and so I wanna make sure that there's an ah vowel at the end of that line or maybe an eh vowel, but never e, you know. Um, that's just, it's hard to sing. When, when you're high in your register. And, and if it ends in an E vowel, then the composer is forced to bring the voices down. It's like the organist having to shut all the shutters, you know, and, and not allow the instrument to really go um, and paint the text as the composer might want to paint that. Um, I'm always mindful too of, of the time signature of what I'm writing. I know I'm not writing music per se, but but with a metered and rhymed poem, it's very easy to, to have a, a sense of metrical structure um, while I'm writing. But even if it's a free verse poem, I always think, okay, let me read this poem if it was in three, and let me read it as if it was in four. And, and I like writing text that could go either way so that the composer is free to do whatever they wish um, or to flip back and forth between different meters. So they're not bound, unless that's what they asked for. They're not bound to a particular kind of metrical structure. I also write too in terms of beats per line. So instead of, you know, shall I compare the to a summer's day, right? That's a very st structured meter. And I think um, there's one of the poems in, in the, 
in the competition list that is iambic pentameter, and so there's a certain number of uh, beats per per line. Um, I can do five lines, but it might not have ten syllables the way that Shakespeare does. So, da 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 di da di da 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 di or something like that. Um, so it'll have the number of beats, but it, it might be variable in terms of 16th and eighth, no, eighth notes that it requires, especially between stanzas as well, forcing the composer to do some variation um, because the audience needs that. And frankly, the singers need that too, um, unless you're singing a hymn in church when it's always the same. And, but we all know the hymns that have, that have multiple verses uh, of lyrics written down. And then sometimes there are little ghost notes that because mm. the lyrics have too many syllables or not enough syllables. Um, it, it's that sort of thing, sort of variations of, uh, on the beats per line rather than on the number of syllables. Um, vowel placement we talked about. Um, I also think too about uh, repeated lines. Which lines are ones that could become a chorus or could become the seeds of a chorus? Sometimes I will repeat the line for the composer in the poem. And when I do it, it's to emphasize, um, or it's just the way that I heard it. Uh, sometimes blurring those lines between me as poet and me as composer, uh, I always try not to force the hand of the composer, but sometimes I really do insist on certain repeats. Um, normally I'm fine with whatever line or word or phrase or even whole stanza that a composer wants to repeat. Uh, they're in charge of the structure and the programming and the journey of the piece. Um, mm -hmm. I try to be mindful of it, but there's all, you know, you can go rogue and, and break that up or have repeats in it, stuff like that. So for composers, you know, knowing, knowing what lyric poets do behind the scenes to get everything ready for you, when, when you, when you have a poem that's been crafted as a lyric poem in front of you, um, there are lots of things that you could do as a composer, uh, to make that process easier. Uh, I would say definitely memorize the poem or try to memorize the poem that you've chosen. Live with it for a while. Go over it again and again and again in your mind. Um, different things will occur to you as, you as you go through it again and again. Just like every time you walk up to a painting that you've seen many times, you'll notice something different or you read Lord of the Rings again after so many years and you'll identify with different characters than you identified yeah. with before. Uh, so too, when you read a poem again, you're different this mm -hmm. time as you were, as opposed to the way you were last time. And so some little nuance or value or color or something might come out at you. So try to memorize the poem. Uh, like I do, try to chant through the poem, write out its rhythmic structure, try to find its hint, its inner rhymes, uh, its delicacies, uh, its little delicious passages. Focus on any color words, um, any paintable images that might be there. But most important, figure out what is the human truth that this poet is trying to express? What is the takeaway? What is the elevator, the 32nd? Hey, what's this poem about? What's the answer to that, po to that question? And then your music is painting that, um, taking the poet's words and illustrating and, and allowing them to grow and, and flourish. Um, every once in a while, a composer will fight against the lyrics and there'll be passages where like one composer would do something one way and another composer will do something completely different. And, and that can be for shock value. It can be highly intentional. Um, or in my case, as a composer, it might just be that I blundered and didn't notice <laughs> what I should have noticed. It's interesting that, that uh, you brought up uh, each morning she walks. Uh, it, it forced both Eric and me to, to switch roles and to do something which we were each very uncomfortable doing. Uh, he had never written any poetry before. I had never composed a, a note of music. And, and so we were both kind of plunged into the, the, the regions of terror. And, and I found myself um, violating a lot of the rules that I now understand or would insist that a composer use on my poetry, um, I, I sort of stepped into the trap I, that I warn everybody else about. So I, I thought that was kind of funny, but I'm proud of the piece that I wrote. I think it works as a, as a choral 
uh, as a choral piece, and and I'd, I'd love the opportunity to compose again. I've had a couple of different opportunities to do it, and it's certainly a fun challenge. Um, but my hat's off to to those of you who are composers and uh, for whom that is your gift. Um, it's it's a gift I, I pull in. Can I jump in? And I, I wanted to see maybe if we just had a, a couple of moments to talk about the, the poem you've written for the New Music Prize. But also, I wanted just to synthesize a couple of the questions we've got here on the sidebar, just to ask yeah. a question about um, kind of honoring the intention of the poet, um, which is exactly what you're talking about here. Like what, we, what we've heard from you brilliantly is that you're very thoughtful as a poet to try and do things which enable the composer and the singers to make the most of the words you're writing. Yeah. And yet, and so, so we've had a question here, which is like, how do you determine the kernel or the highlights within the poem? Someone's asked about um, your poem, When Awful Silent, is, is asked, do you consider the Volta in the piece, then slowly I turn my gaze? Now, it may be the case that you, you do think these things, but is there also a sense in which, like, I, I say this as someone who, like, as a, lit as a reader of poetry and of, and of literature, I tend to go more towards the kind of deconstruction list post-structuralist idea, which is, I think, just to make sure everyone's aware, is the idea that kind of we, we, we don't necessarily stick to the conventions or believe necessarily in the prescribed meanings for things, but we make up our own mind about how we respond to the words on the page. Yeah. Um, and to what extent, um, thinking about all these questions and hearing your thoughts about them because it's your poem, is it also okay when people come to setting your poem, are they allowed to, do, do you feel comfortable with them saying, I see why he's done this. Actually, I think this is the way. Does that does that offend you as a poet? Does that do you like the idea that people are taking it and then pulling it in different directions? How does yeah. that make you feel? Um, I, I think part of the collaborative process, um, and and I've worked with many many composers over many years. Part of that collaborative process is is a kind of surrender to to another creative spirit, right? It's it's glorious, but it's also uh, it's also terrifying to sort of give your baby up as a hostage uh, to someone else's creative <laughs> process. And I've had I've had uh, I've worked with composers who meticulously follow uh, everything that I I laid out. And then there are other composers that that take a machete to my work and and break the poem apart deconstruct it and reconstruct it in a different way or they'll only take a word here or a phrase there that the, my intention exists over here separately as a poem on a page and what they actually set and what audiences and choristers experience is something dramatically different it's it's almost my poem having been crunched up and digested into lyrics by that particular composer and I've learned to work in, in, in all those ways. Um, I'm always very surprised um, when I, and, if, and it's, I'm thrilled when I get the score or when I hear a premiere performance of a work and I, I get to find out for the first time whether or not a composer sort of got it as I, as I laid it out or whether they went in a different direction. And, and the illustrated books are another example of that. You know, when, when you write a story and you give it over to an illustrator they're telling their story. They've read your writing and they've absorbed it and it means something to them that's different than what it meant to you. And then they're going to paint or draw their interpretation. And so it really becomes a collaborative effort, even though the poem is fixed and already made, it still can change and alter. And, and yeah, to answer your question, I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, I think it's exciting to see what composers do and what kind of musical material comes to their spirit uh, based on what I write. There are some composers that only use my poem as inspiration and they end up doing something completely different. So can I, can I ask you then, there's one, there's, there's one more pair of questions that I want to just address here before we maybe move on to the poem, which sure. is, um, and I, I have feelings about this, but I would love to hear yours. Um, there, the first one's from um, Kerry Nix, and it just says, you know, as a poet, is it offensive or in poor taste for a composer to repeat or omit certain lines of a text for emphasis or to switch around stanzas to fit a musical idea? And that that then is um, that sort of mirrors a question by Lindley earlier, which is how much license do you have in terms of changing the text slightly or moving swathes of text to fit your composition? Yeah. 
Um, th these are very good questions. Um, and, and I'm kind of of two minds about it, to be honest. Uh, if, if, if I'm writing for you, it's, it's because you commissioned me to do it. And so my job is to give to a composer exactly what they want and need with the understanding that as the compositional process unfolds, if they need more or less text, if they want to do a repeat or whatever, like I'm here, just call me, email me, and we can we can work it out. Sometimes I really like what the composer has done. And when I publish my poem later in a book, I'll, uh, it'll be the altered version of the poem because it's better. Uh, always opening up to another creative mind, I think it makes better art, really. C collaborative art is better art. In, in many respects than, than solo art um, because you, you, you kind of lose objectivity in that way. Um, another part of me says that, you know, Shakespeare is Shakespeare and a sonnet has to have this many lines and, it, and you don't alter somebody like Shakespeare or Robert Frost or whatever. Uh, another part of me is like, well, Shakespeare's dead and, and his <laughs> poems are raw material. And if your art is, uh, collage based and you take little bits of this like a magpie and, and may put it together in a different way that's your voice that's what you want to do with the raw material of Shakespeare so I, I think there's an argument to be made on either on either side to to use a poem as a as a fixed idea uh, as, as something sacred or to to break it up and change it and alter it and living uh, you know for, for my poem for example I wrote it the way I thought it should go but but I have enough experience with composers to know that that what the audience is going to hear is not necessarily the words that I wrote down on the page. Now, if you're repeating a line, if you're if you're repeating a stanza, I'm cool with that. If you're switching the order of things so as to change the meaning of the poem or if you're omitting certain lines because you don't agree with them or, or whatever, then, then there's no me left. You've amputated too much of what my poem was about, right? And so at, at that point, I would ask if, if this was a commission uh, collaboration uh, that you'd contact me and, and I'll write something different for you that, that speaks to what you want. Maybe they change their mind and they don't want it to be so sacred or they need it to be more sacred or whatever. Um, that's another idea that, uh, that Johnny, something you said uh, has triggered me. Uh, I try to make my poetry sacred enough to be interpreted as sacred by someone who brings that theology to the concert, mm -hmm. but universalized and scrubbed enough that it's not sacred to someone who doesn't want to be exposed, like a high school choir director, for example, who has a problem programming sacred music. Um, and yet you want to write something that could also be done in church. So how do you, how do you tread that line anyway? You, it's, it's kind of just to interject to say, I, I agree with you entirely about the idea sort of to, and this is not as a poet, so forgive my um, impertinence here, but there, there, it, you were talking earlier about the golden ratio and, and the structure of a poem in order to, to reach a kind of zenith that when you want to reach it. And I think, to 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 invert the order of things is to interrupt that is to is to disrupt that in a way that I don't think honors the poem. Whereas you know to 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 find a way of perhaps using using the kind of the instrument you're writing for the choral instrument to highlight what you, you know if you if you if you wanted to have a moment of polyphony where a word was heard at four different times in a reasonably similar moment to have effect. Yeah. For instance, that doesn't necessarily. Uh, that undermine the integrity of the poem. So I, I, so I think that, I mean, I agree with you wholeheartedly, but it's, it's interesting. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to have just a piece of homophony, which does everything at the same time in the same order. Anyway, it's just, just a no, little. That's, that's, that's well put. And, and, and I would agree to that, you know, the repetition of a word or a line here and there for emphasis and then, and then to bring back a musical motif, um, Again, I, I give my poem over to the composer, and now it's the composer's story to tell, right? Uh, it becomes it becomes part of the DNA of the finished piece. Um, but I understand that that there are alterations that happen, and there are interpretations that happen. Um, 
So I think I think before we come to our final questions, would you mind just giving a few minutes to the poem that you've written for this? Of course. Thank of you. Course. There's a slide of that, uh, Eddie. If you could put that up, uh, um, yeah. and you you can find it too on the uh, um, on the competition site. So we spoke about this idea of of all the choirs in the world falling silent and we can't rehearse together we can't be together we can't perform together and how awful that is but eventually we are going to come back and we're going to sing again um as you can imagine i was asked by a lot of ensembles to write something very much like that and so i tried to find multiple ways of looking at that same idea um and so when all falls silent uh is is sort of a, a deeply personal journey kind of approach to it. I almost imagined myself kind of sitting in meditative posture. Um, I, I envisioned it as a kind of glassy sea um, effect. Uh, so I would be surprised, for example, if, if it was a very blip bloppy rhythmic setting of my text, that, that sort of that's not the music I tried to imbue in it, just as an example. Um, when all falls silent and the breath of life flows from the source and calms the stormy sea, my heart song, always sung but seldom heard, rises from the midst, mist calling, calling. Right? To me, that's very quiet. It's longing, it's, it's pensive, it is anticipatory, right? Um, I imagined choral music as this thing that left us and is out there somewhere. Um, my heart song, the thing that I want to do. Um, it, it calls to me. And, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities in that stanza. Um, there's a lot of color words. I love color words, calling, whispering, darkness, shadow, silence, um, falling, stormy. Th these are wonderful words and they, they are, every one of those words is like an underhand softball pitch to the, to the composer, right? If they want to smack, a home run it, it's there it's the easiest pitch possible um so it may it may appeal to a composer to to paint those words it, they may have other melodic or musical ideas that they're that they're doing um but i tried to imbue it with as, as much color as possible um you asked about the volta then so just grammatically there was a statement the creation of a kind of world then, right? So the Volta idea here comes right in the middle. Now that's not the golden mean. So if I were approaching it as a composer, again, I, I don't want to influence anybody, but I would probably have to repeat something from the first stanza um, in order to push that then a little further down in the octavo to, to, to be the Volta where we need it. Um, there's a lot of repeatable cool stuff and and probably you composers will write delicious stuff for that first stanza that you'll want to hear again we will all, the singers will want to sing it again and the audience will want to hear it again so yeah th 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 there can be repeats and and for those reasons but also the repeats will push the volta down to the golden mean of the octavo um, then then but it's not an exciting volta. It's it's this hesitant, slow, slowly I turn my gaze, drawn toward beauty and the song's amber light. I open my soul and I am at peace. I am in harmony, listening, listening. So I've almost forced the composer to have a structure that that starts quiet gets louder and then goes back to quiet again, right? You don't want the choir screaming, listening, listening. It doesn't make any sense, right? At least that's, that's how I see it. Um, and so as a composer, I would have to ask myself, where is the climax? 
does this does my coral piece have a climax or does it have a nadir? Uh, the high point or the low point, right? Um, where should that occur? That's up to you. What this what the structure is? Are there two high points like a bridge, right? Um, and if so, identifies I, identify where in the poem those are. Uh, is there one in the first stanza? Is there one in the second stanza? That creates a kind of a structure where the volta mm -hmm. occurs at the trough between two absolutely symmetrical equal climaxes uh, or uh, the sort of um, minor climax and then the major climax later. There are so many possibilities. Uh, and again, I, I part of this is intention on my part and part of it is just I stumbled on writing something I thought was cool and it has all those structural elements uh, in it. Um, I yeah, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Thank and, you. And all the others, are, all the others are like that too. They all have embedded structure that you can either celebrate and live in the rules that the poet has created for you, or if it is your intention to do so, you can break that structure up and and uh, uh, craft it differently. The way that uh, the way that Malcolm Geith did with his sonnet, right? Uh, there's a there's a structure and a rhyme scheme to it, but it's not what you expect. Um, some of the stanzas are are like A B A, and some of them are A B B, and so the rhyme scheme is kind of wonky. Uh, there are lots of different forms of sonnets, but but he does unexpected things there. Um, to, again, to give you structure if you want it, there are rhyming words, and it's in iambic pentameter, and so it's there, but. It, there's also hints and DNA of different structures that you could also build there. Um, his three, yeah. three, 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 two is also a, a kind of a strange thing. Again, there are many different types of sonnets, but so this could easily be a form that I'm not familiar with, but um, it's almost kind of a deconstructed and reconstructed Shakespearean sonnet in, in some respects. So it <laughs> plays with structure. Um, it's, and it invites the composer to play with structure as well. Well, it's something I love. I know from I, I remember being obsessed with particularly Shakespeare sonnets, and I remember reading all 150 multiple times and annotating them on planes. I remember one <laughs> long where after we performed, actually after we performed Rivers Events in the Sydney Opera House, I was annotating it on the flight from uh, Auckland back to London. Uh, my copy again, and I, I think that there's a question here, which is, um, you know, what's the? Um, uh, let me just find it. Um, how important and necessary are rhymes when writing poetry for music? And I, I thought it was very interesting because what I what some I, I love, for instance, and like Emily Dickinson does that a lot, which you've got a poem of hers here, the, 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 the power of I rhymes versus actually kind of sonic rhymes where you think you see something and it sounds very different. And I like, right. for me, I, I like the power you have then as someone who's giving it a, an audible voice to say like, I'm gonna draw your ear to the fact that you thought this might be a rhyme to look at the page. It's not that when you hear it out loud. I mean, I, and that's, that's a fun thing here, like the, the 33332 meter slightly subverts what you think of the kind of the metronomy of a, of a sonnet. Right. And some rhymes carry over from one stanza to another, yeah. um, which is not, not usual. Um, I love internal rhymes and, and kind of subtle wink at you not rhymes, um, assonance as well as alliteration, um, rhyming vowels. Uh, is also a fun thing to set. Again, I, I try to, I try to craft a lot of little things like that that are in the, my poetry that are there for the setting, if the composer notices or wants to set them, or or if they go that way, that the raw material is there, um, to to build whatever structure that they that they want to build, um, and yeah, I love the the this this group of five, five poems. They're they're all very different. Um, the mystical Emily Dickinson kind of unstructured weirdness of that, the highly um, uh, metrical rhyming uh, Dunbar poem, um, my sort of free verse, structured free verse thing, the kind of deconstructed sonnet. There, there's lots of different things to play with there, lots of choices. And uh, I think one or more of these texts is gonna is gonna snag every composer that looks at them. There's gonna you're gonna find some something um, to grab onto there. I agree. 
Well, you. This has been so generous of you. Thank you so much. I think oh, I'm gonna, my, there's, there's one. More, there's one more question I'd like to ask, which was yes. asked right at the beginning of the session here, and uh, and it came from uh, it came from Spudlington. And the question is: Do you have any tips for getting into the right emotional state to allow yourself to connect to the music when you're starting a? Mm. Uh, it says a collaboration here, but I mean, I think when you're writing or when you're composing, like, what do you do to uh, to kind of inhabit the right kind of spirit? One of the most important things that I do is I try to talk to the composer and I ask really leading questions that that get at the composers that, that, that get at the emotional journey that the composer wants the audience to go on. And so I start with notes from that conversation, which is basically kind of an emotion map that it's rhythmic and 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 prickly and dramatic or it's smooth and silky I, the, the composer will use words that will help me understand what they want and then very often i might go and listen to some music for a week or so that i'll ask the composer what kind of music do you think about when this piece when the piece you want to write like is it is it this soundtrack or that soundtrack Right. And then I'll go to that music and kind of live in that musical world for a while um, to kind of get my intention in tuned to the emotion of what I'm trying to write. That's probably the most important thing that I do. And then I have certain rituals and I'm sure every composer does as well. Uh, I always handwrite uh, with a particular kind of pencil and uh, uh, on notebook paper. And then I organize things in a particular way and uh, I keep all of my notes and my scratch outs and all that kind of stuff. And when something is ready and and settable, then I will copy it out in in all capitals. So whenever I see something in my notes that's in all capital letters, I know, oh, that line is the way it's going to be. It's it sort of it becomes gelled and then it'll move through mm -hmm. the rest of the, the poem in in its in its finished state. Just little rituals like that help me to get in the right mindset. Again, for a composer setting a poem, um, read the poem, read it again, read it a hundred times, memorize it, find the rhythm in it, chant it, really understand what is it that the poet is saying and how am I as a composer going to add to that my voice to, to, to draw attention to the listener to the meaning of that poem. Um, really, as a choral art, and I'll just sort of end with this, why do choruses exist? We exist in order to communicate text to the audience. It's not, with all due respect to the composers, it's not the music. It's the text that is being communicated by the choir. If the choir is not going to focus on the text, if they're not going to understand the meaning of the text, if they're not going to emote the text, then they may as well be a string quartet because string players, they don't have to breathe. They're better, right? They can have they can have 40 measure lines if you want. Singers can't do that, right? Singers are both bound by text and, and liberated by it. It gives a choir something to do, something that they can do that no other ensemble can do, which is communicate text. And that's the lyricist speaking. It's my part of the process is the most important part. <laughs> I can say that. Um, so the composer would ask themselves, what is the human truth that's being expressed here? Where in the poem is that expressed? And how am I going to craft a piece of music that tells that story, that illuminates this poem in a way that the choir can then touch the heart of somebody in the audience? And you, you can transform someone's life with beautiful music, but you can really transform someone's life when beautiful music and powerful poetry are combined and performed in a way that the King Singers can perform it to, to, to profoundly affect somebody's uh, trajectory of their life. It's true. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think that whenever we give workshops, I think we always say, start with the text. The text is the most important thing. That's what we have that others don't have. And, and, and actually, I remember very clearly um, the, the Nobel uh, laureate Kazuo Shigeru, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature a couple of years ago, said that there is 
there is something about the human voice when it's singing that can capture the magic in the text more than any other thing. So I think we have to realize this extraordinary mm. power that we have as yeah. singers and also the people who are writing for singers. So mm. thank you from, from the bottom of our hearts. This has been such a joy, not just for writing an awful silent for the new music prize, but also for spending this hour with us here with the two of us and with everyone who's taken part. Thank you to all of you for, 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 participating in the chat and listening and, and we hope that this has been helpful um to remind you tony i wonder if you might have some props just to quickly show a couple of the things i mentioned at the beginning so tony's got a new book out a silver thread which is a collection of his um his poetry that he's written for um commissions for um settings uh for choirs over the last 20 years there it is look at how beautiful it is that is now on sale as well as the two wonderful picture books um of sleep and also of leonardo dreams of his flying machine Le oh. Wow, there we are. And then, thank you very much. And then the coveted, the coveted recording of the Sacred Veil, which will, will come out um, on. And I, oh my, we haven't even had time to talk about the Sacred Veil, but I, I urge you all, please listen, please, please um, read. It is so profoundly musing, uh, moving, not musing, moving. Um, and, and, and a real story from your life. I think that's, it's important to know this is, these are, these are real text written by you and Eric and your wife, your late wife. And it's amazing. Um, we, yes, thank you very much again. Thank you to all of you. Next week, there is going to be another one of these workshops. Uh, Eddie and I actually didn't talk about who would say this or whether it's me, so I'm just gonna do it. Um, right. But there's another one of these workshops about writing, writing for voices and um, composing with Eric Whitaker. It's gonna be, he's gonna be joined by our colleagues. I know, can you believe it? He's gonna be joined <laughs> by our colleagues, Chris or Bruiser and Pat um, at the same time next Saturday. So please do tune in. It would be lovely to have you there. And we hope that it's helpful for submitting your entries to the New Music Prize. And trust me when I say that we are all so excited to receive what you will compose. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. And I look forward to hearing what everybody comes up with. Thank you. Oh, we'll share it, don't worry. Thank you and have a wonderful evening, everyone.